Look at this. The front page of the Columbus Dispatch yesterday has a new rock star on it. Just one name, Maya. Maya Hazlitt, another rock star, Alicia. Alicia Palmer here, planting the flags on the lawn at First Church. Thank you, Mark, for your leadership with the youth. And there it was on page one of the Columbus Dispatch. Our kids, those flags represent all who have lost their lives to COVID-19. We have in the ground, as of last week, 300 flags. Now, every flag is representative of 1,000 people. You'll say we haven't lost 300,000 people, but we have 300 flags. I would like to tell you that we will pull some of those flags out of the ground because we have overstated the number. As of this morning, though, there are 281,000 who have died to COVID-19. So let us pause in a moment of silence and give thanks to God for the leadership of our youth that the city now knows are showing us the way, the path through the wilderness. Would you pause with me in silence and lift up those 281,000 people? Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. If I had stood in this pulpit one year ago today, on the second Sunday of Advent in 2019, and told you that I had had a vision a vision of over 14.7 million Americans virally infected and more than 281,000 Americans dead from a virus uh, that in my vision was called COVID-19, of businesses and corporations all working from home, of food being regularly delivered to your door of restaurants closed and schools and universities and churches and public meetings and rallies all being done on Zoom and live streaming of economic shutdowns and hardships of seven hours of curfew every night in Columbus, Ohio, of a reckoning of racial justice across our land, of thanksgiving with no one at the table except a computer screen with 30 people on Zoom again, with a church building that is mostly closed, you would have asked me to go see a psychiatrist and seek the appropriate medication and help that I needed. Or perhaps you would simply have asked me to take my vision and just leave. But I would not have left until I made sure that all of the alien monoliths in Utah and California and Romania had been removed and we were safe again from alien invasion. <laughs> then I know you would have escorted me from the building. So it seems absolutely impossible, incredible, 52 weeks ago, has become our daily reality. Home has taken on a whole new meaning. Home is where we reside, but it has also become where many of us work. Many of us go to school. Many of us go to church. Most of us cook and eat all our meals there. That's new. These four walls that we call home have taken on much more meaning in 2020 Instead of the place of refuge and safe return, our fall, four walls have become our entire universe. But unlike the homes we have come to know and love through the generations, our homes have also become bunkers against a tiny unseen enemy, a virus which strikes quick and hard. Many of us have not had guests or friends or even family in our homes in nine months. That seems 
impossible. If I had told you that a year ago, you would have sent me off for help. And the ones who have entered have had to pass all sorts of tests and stayed masked and gloved and sent to their rooms. As parents, you know, sending your kids to their rooms used to be a really bad thing. Now we call it quarantine. That's something to remember for the future and use that as well. Home has become a nest and a fort. Home has become a place of respite and protection. Home has become a place of comfort, but also a desert of sorts. Our homes have become our postinia. In his book, The Desert in the City, Brother Carlos Coretta, the desert monk from North Africa, writes uh, after he moves into the metropolis of Rome about the word postinia. It's a Russian word, and it is the word for desert. While postinia may mean a geographical place, it is also a hermitage. It is a quiet place. It is a place set apart. Postinia can be a place where people go, where they withdraw in silence and discover God. As one Russian mystic has written, Postinia is the place where we raise the arms of prayer and penance toward God. Postinia is the place where we gather courage. It is the place where we pronounce words of truth, remembering that God is truth. It is the place where we purify ourselves and prepare ourselves to act as if touched by the burning coal that was placed by the angel on the lips of the prophet. This Advent, we are called to discover Postinia, the desert in our homes. We are called home to Postinia, to gather courage and pronounce the truth, remembering that God is the truth. We just heard in the scriptures that the word of God is there forever goes beyond all things. In the desert, in the city, in the desert, in our homes, we will discover the truth of this season in unlikely places and from unsuspecting people. Just ask Bill Gettler. Bill is a Presbyterian minister and assistant dean of ministerial studies at Yale Divinity School. Bill discovered truth on Church Street in New Haven, Connecticut in the person of Danny, a homeless neighbor of his. Bill tells the story of Danny, who first appeared on his front porch on a cold December afternoon a number of years ago with his hat literally in hand. He was honest, at least. He had been sleeping there since getting back to town. He said mostly he slept on the porch of the Red Cross headquarters across the street from the church. The people there didn't seem to mind, and he always cleared out before anyone arrived for work in the morning. He didn't want anyone to be frightened. He needed some food. He needed some money for a bus pass, and Bill had just hung his Moravian Christmas star on the front porch and placed his Advent candles in the windows and he was a minister after all, so it was pretty tough for him to refuse someone aid. So against his better judgment, he dug into his wallet and he found a few dollars to help Danny. As he was leaving, Danny turned and looked at Bill in the eyes and asked, is this the way it's supposed to be? He was off before Bill could reply or even register what he just said. He came back with one need or another throughout the winter and then across the years that followed. Through housing placements and jobs that never seemed to work out for Danny, Bill kept track of him or as he tells the story, maybe it was Danny who was keeping track of Bill. <laughs> Their conversations would always open with, good morning, Reverend. And then shortly after that, Danny would deliver his one-line sermon. Reverend, is this the way it's supposed to be? It reached the point where Bill did everything he could to avoid Danny. Slowly, he would take steps another direction, 
crossing the street to avoid him, admitting that he did not like the relationship they had at all. He did not want to hear that question. He did not want to hear the one-line sermon all over again. Reverend, is this the way it's supposed to be? On the surface, this question seems innocuous. As you dig deeper, it is disarming. And as you go even deeper, it is haunting. Is God's creation supposed to be this disharmonious? Is society supposed to be taking care of its members on the margins? Is it supposed to be that people have to beg for a living for some of them while others are paid for their work? and have a place to call home? Are we supposed to be arguing that black lives really matter? Are we supposed to be divided as a nation over our most fundamental understandings of how democracy and elections work? Are we supposed to be in our homes, isolated like desert flowers blooming in sand-blown earth? during the season of Advent and Christmas? Is this what Postinia looks like and feels like? Lord, how long will our stay-at-home orders be? Is it supposed to be this way? John the Baptist didn't believe that things were supposed to be the way they were. John that odd and challenging cousin of Jesus and the first prophet of our Christian tradition appears in the wilderness with a two-line sermon, not unlike Danny's one-liner. Drawing on Isaiah's 500-year-old prophetic words, John proclaims, prepare the way of the Lord, make God's path straight. People must look at him as if he's crazy but they are also drawn to him. They offer him bread to go with his wild honey. They give him bus tickets, hoping that he'll take a a long trip to Syria and maybe just keep heading that direction. Like us, they would prefer to hear about the wonderful baby Jesus, you know, his little cousin. People would say, hey John, tell us about your cousin and his mom and dad and their journey they took to, to Bethlehem. We've heard this great story that how they ended up in the manger and everything. Tell us about the Messiah born there in the stable with all the animals. You know, the one we put on our Christmas cards. And John says, you are not ready for that story. You're not ready. You need to remember Isaiah first. Do you even know what Isaiah said? Do you remember what he said? He said, every valley will be lifted up. Every hill will be knocked down that equity will come for the meek, justice will come for the poor, and that is how our Lord is showing up. That's how he's coming. Have you even read that? The postinia out of which John comes and from which he speaks is a desert that is courageous and speaks the truth that we hesitate to hear. We want Christmas without prophets. We want birth narratives without desert storms. We want redemption without judgment. We want equity without losing anything or giving anything up. And we want peace with no struggle. In addition, we all want the Danny's and Danny's echoing words on Church Street Is this the way it's supposed to be, to just go away and leave us alone? In the popular culture of which we're all a part, Christmas arrives following Halloween, and it comes to full revelation just a few minutes after we've cleared the dishes from the Thanksgiving table. It comes with a plastic baby Jesus in a manger with songs of angels sung overheads in malls and stores. You may remember those days. Now it comes on our computers, also singing to us, out of cyberspace purchasing modes. It comes from the God of consumerism. But you know what? We actually pay homage to and worship and follow a different God. 
Our God comes where our God comes. Our God comes from the desert. Our God comes from the postinia of the city and our homes. From the desert of our homes, God proclaims comfort. Oh, comfort my people. God is calling us to establish our homes this Christmas in places of comfort where we can prepare a place for the coming of Christ. So before God arrives, let's get ready. How about we get ready? This Advent, let us all allow God to make the rough places in our lives plain again. Let us allow God to make the anxiety of our lives peaceful again. Let us allow God in to make the distress of our lives a place of rest again. And let us allow God in to care for the poverty in and around us. Let us allow God in to establish postinia in our homes and in our hearts. Only then will God's peace and will God's justice fill the earth. When we allow God in, we can turn Danny's haunting question into our statement of Christmas faith. This is the way it's supposed to be. Amen.